this is the first time I've I've had a go at doing a vlog, so uh, yeah, bear with me. Um, hello, I'm Jason uh, from A Great Alternative. Today we're out in the woods, and I'm with a bushcraft in inspector, a bushcraft expert uh, named JD from How Bushcraft. I've been doing some filming with Jamie recently for a documentary that I'm doing for the channel, and I. As part of that, I've given him photos and videos and different bits and pieces that he can just have and use however he wants for his business. Um, and then in return, he's been giving me some bushcraft skills and, and hopefully some skills that can be taken back to the homestead. Today, we're going to learn different skills involved with setting up a camp. I'm going to learn about you know why he picks that camp, what he looks for when picking a camp uh, as a bushcraft instructor who's going to take courses there, and then basically the things that you know he has to do to get it ready. So let's get going. <laughs> so you've got to make sure you put it in right first time, yeah? <laughs> That's it, don't tell anyone. Shh. If we take that down... That's it. We'll <laughs> start again after the wind. Sure. So I apologise for the wind, everyone. Okay, so welcome, Jamie. Hello. Um, I've got a few questions for you in regards to setting up a camp. Let's do it. Right. Yeah. What is it that you look for when you're setting up a camp? Sure. Um, so uh, a lot of it's practical stuff. So flat ground, mostly. Um, and then resources to hand to teach the lessons I want to teach. So like here, for example, we're in an area woodland which has got quite a mix of terrain. So just beyond the bits of trees that we're in, it's quite undulating. There's loads of rocks and stuff which makes for a beautiful space. But in terms of like having eight people stood in front of me all working with knives, I just need, you know, a volume of space basically. Uh, and nice and flat, so there's no trip hazards or anything else. So a lot of the prep that we do is just making this, you know, maybe like square, I don't know, 20 meters, relatively hazard free. But the rest of the woods then we leave more or less untouched so that people get that kind of naturalistic experience. Um, and then outside of that, so if we're looking at a new site, we'll visit it in as many different um, like weather situations as possible. So me and Max were here a month ago when we had all that apocalyptic rain and like the whole forest was washed out. There were streams in places where I'd never seen streams before, but we came to where we wanted to put the camp. And the, well, the original idea actually was just over there and that was, um, had a stream running through it. <laughs> so it wasn't there when it was anything but apocalyptic rain, but yeah, there was a new stream. So we just came this, what's that? Maybe 30 meters this way. And we've got a space which even then when the whole forest was flooded, this was just totally dry. Um, but also a nice place to be. So there's plenty of moss on the ground. Um, it's relatively kind of sheltered. So where we operate from a public woodland as well. So there's footpaths um, and bridleways and that sort of thing running through the woods, which is lovely for me because I grew up here. And I think, you know, making use of spaces like this um, has its value in itself. But for the sake of a bit of privacy when we're trying to run a session or something, having these kind of screen blocks almost with the holly. So they block a bit of the wind today. The trees above us are going mental, but down here it's not actually that windy, um, which protects the fire as well for cooking. So having a bit of a break for that. And then, um, then I start looking at really specific things. So things like, are there any trees that need to come out because they're gonna drop, like fall over on us or drop branches on us? Is there strong enough tie out points for the big tarps? So we've got some big, you know, maybe 40, 50 year old pine trees to tie off to, which is great. Um, and then other than that, like, yeah, yeah. once I've got the kind of practicalities of running lo the logistics of a course, I've then got the practicalities of the physical space. I then just start to sit down and think, well, is it a nice place to be? So I'll just come here on my own, you know, over the space of a couple of weeks and just sit down for an hour or two and just, yeah, have a coffee and just see what the space feels like. Because a lot of the, what clients get out of the courses is that kind of experiential just being in the woods. And for a lot of people, it might be that they've never camped in the woods before. So if I happen to pick a bit of woodland that, you know, like it could be anything from, we were overlooking Sheffield is about six miles that way. So if I happen to pick a bit of woods where you can just see like lights of Sheffield, it diminishes the course. Or 
if we were any higher up into the woods, the wind like this would just make the whole place a nightmare just to be wind tunnel. So again, they just have a miserable time. So I just like to get really familiar. But like I say, I mean, I grew up in these woods, like I've lived 10 minutes down the road my entire life. So I already know these woods intimately. Whereas when I've set up places, set up base camps for other companies or uh, for other outdoor centers, it is that sort of thing. It become, it just becomes the, the practical tick list of like, yes, this is safe. Yes, there are resources here. You know, there's this, that, and the other. Um, and then you kind of have to lean on the experience of the people that are actually working there to go, yeah, this is a nice bit, or this is a really noisy bit of woodland, or whatever it is. Once you've picked your camp, mm -hmm. what are the jobs that are then uh, you then got to do next? Yeah. Before, between picking the camp and actually having customers come and join you. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so dead quickly, um, we'd uh, prepare the ground. So you can see at the minute, we're just pulling out some of the brambles that are in the way. Uh, I try and do as little as possible, because we do want to protect the ecosystem and, and the environment. But yeah, having like trip hazards all over camp um, and prickles in your arse when you're trying to sit down is not great. So ground preparation, we then look at rigging the group tarp. So we have, um, when we're here, we'll set up an expedition style tarp, um, which is there for the whole weekend which just needs really solid anchors. So the next thing we look at is, so like I've got this space here. Um, so I've got a good amount of open space there and I've got a good amount of open space there apart from this tree. Um, and then I've got these two good trees here for a ridge line. So I start looking at things like, that and go, okay, well, if I run a ridge line across the middle of my space, I can tarp off that whole side there. And then that's easily enough to get 10 people out of the, out of the rain. I could potentially take out this tree um, which is not looking very healthy. You can see it's died at the top anyway. Um, and it's in, a, it's in the shadow now of a lot of these pines that have grown up around it. So we could drop that tree and then we'd have all that space as well. Um, and then we look at water acquisition. So where's our nearest stream that we can pull drinking water from? Um, we use one of them Lifesaver jerry cans on the courses, which filters out everything, including viruses. Um, so as long as I've got a water source that isn't running off agriculture and is full of pesticides and stuff, then we, we just use that to produce drinking water, um, which there is a stream about uh, probably 70 metres that way. So we've got drinking water, we've got a nice space to be, uh, we've got a roof over our heads. We'll then rig up a, um, a what would you call it? A trench <laughs> but yeah we need somewhere to go to the toilet so for the most part client because we've got this big expansive space clients are welcome to go for a wee wherever they want really we suggest better spots than others um, but for anything more serious than a wee we'll, we'll set up an expedition trench which um, we try and bring some of the comforts in from home so we part of some of the courses is teaching people how to how to do that how to make a, a toilet outside but we, we've also got like a bucket seat so we just build a bit of a, a range canopy over that so that, yeah, you know, if it's chucking down with rain, at least you can sit down on something and be protected while you go. Um, and that's, again, in a really he heavily um, holly covered area. So, they, you know, they feel like they've got some privacy. Um, and then that's about it, to be honest. We don't, we, we try and keep um, our camps minimalistic, I suppose, in the sense that the specifics of what, I want to teach with Howl is journeying skills, so it's expedition bushcraft. Um, and so the idea of like building a load of tables and having a built kitchen and that sort of thing, um, it just, it, it, it would work and it'd be great to have, you know, like a, a kitchen here to be able to do stuff like that. But at the minute, the courses that we're running, it would take away from, like if I have to teach people how to, I don't know, prepare a fish that they potentially caught in a Scottish lock, if I then take them to a table to do that, when they go to do it in the wild and there's suddenly there's no table, you know, so be, by being able to provide a natural workspace to do that in, it, it all kind of flows better then. So that's that's been the way that we've run Howl for the last five years. Um, and I think predominantly that's how we like to do it. Just more than anything to prove that you don't really need anything else. Like, yeah, it's great if you, you could have like an out, a wilderness kitchen with a, you know, nice um, chainsaw planks beam and stuff like that for a table um but also you can just sit on the floor and that's fine and I, I you know actually it's really connected to nature and you feel like you've zero impact and i've got a full kitchen at home so if i want to go and get elaborate i can go into that um so yeah that's kind of that's kind of it so somewhere to somewhere to be 
resources for materials for courses, water to drink. It's kind of, that's all we do. Um, the first couple of years worth of clients coming through will select sites to sleep for their weekends. And then they'll, part of their training will be, how do you process a wild space in order to sleep there? So it might be removing the odd bramble, being selective about where you want to lay down. And then as time progresses in one spot, they then just, you know, you get somebody comes in who's the previous weekend, somebody slept in a space. It looks like a lovely place to sleep already. So they just naturally choose them places and then they get used. So how did you get access to this site? Uh, so it's Forestry Especially Commission. As you're, you know, um, running a business for it as well. Yeah, sure. Um, yes, yeah, so it's Forestry Commission Woodland. Um, so they, um, like across the country, they've got varying degrees to which they want to work with other people. So um, forests. I'm I'm lucky here in that the type of forestry that they're doing is not ready yet for felling. So this forest isn't ready for harvesting. Um, so at the minute, it's just kind of sat here, uh, waiting for the trees to get to the right size which benefits me um, and then also I've got quite a decent relationship with the forestry team here already again just from having grown up in the village you kind of come out on volunteer days you get to know people that sort of thing um, but yeah I mean basically I just approached the landowner so I found out who owned the woodland in my specific instance it's the forestry commission and I said you know I've got a business that I want to run out of the woodland um, they ask you for whatever details and resources they want from you so things like risk assessments operating procedures protocols um, and generally like how busy you anticipate being as well um, and it just kind of progresses so that it goes through a few different people uh, and at some point somebody says yeah cool go ahead <laughs> um, and then you get permission to operate and then as long as you act within the perimeters of your permission so there are certain things I can do in the woods and certain things I can't um, so this is like a thousand acre woodland we can only have fires here and so like I respect that as their restrictions um, but also then I'm on the other side of that, unrestricted here. So I can do whatever I want with fire in this space. Um, so whether that's digging a ground oven or, you know, we, we theoretically got permission to um, set off a, uh, a signal fire if we wanted to. I might just want to clear it with the local airports and that sort of thing. <laughs> but yeah, so um, but that's it. Yeah, so just approaching the landowner um, and being patient and respectful. And if they'd have said no, then I'd have tried to find somewhere else to operate yeah and when uh, you're setting up the camp and starting you know coming down here for the day is there a list of kind of tools that are must-haves when you come down with you and also do you need more than one person could i set up this base camp on my own i've got max sat over there drinking coffee <laughs> yeah, no, no. I've just done all of this. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now i reckon i could um it just takes ages so like rigging up the main tarp there's a cow tail flapping about in the wind there so, for example, we need to clip into that with a carabiner, get the under, other end of that ridge line up into a tree and pull tight, whilst having, that. in the meantime, attaching the tarp to that line so the tarp goes up as I pull that down. So it's all these things where if I'm doing it on my own, it has to be like A, B, C, D, E, F. Whereas having somebody else here, you're kind of catching each other's mistakes, but also just generally helping out. Um, so, yeah, I have done it on my own. So for the first two years I ran howl on my own so that was like literally I would turn up with my car and build a camp on my own for three hours in the dark and then go and meet my clients and bring them into the woods um, I've now got to a place where I have lovely people like Max working with me um, so it just makes it easier but yeah in terms of tools once camp's set up we don't like there's, there's no tool work essentially like because everything's where in its place and we know which branch is going to have which rope tied to it and all that sort of thing um but generally speaking in in order to set one up from scratch yeah having an axe uh, so like one of those uh three quarter length axes that's a pretty decent size so you've got enough enough power for things like taking a tree down if i need to but also if we're doing things like making bigger tent pegs for tying the big tarp up, that does all that work. Um, we've got a folding book saw as well um, in the pouch. So inside there is a folding book saw, it's basically a bow saw. Um, so a blade of about 21, 20, 24 inches. Again, it's just, just big enough to go through stuff about the size of my thigh. Anything bigger than that, I don't really have any reason, I don't have any need for that sort of size timber. Um, so with no need for things like chainsaws or anything like that um, and then a belt knife and that's about it to be honest like the again 
the sort of camp that I want to have set up is it's there as part of the course so by coming into this base camp that we set up you could look at it and go oh cool I could set that up on the lock on the, on the side of a lock in Scotland or Sweden or somewhere with the things that I might have in my rucksack so it's that it just it's that follow through that kind of consistent theme of like these are journeying skills so the things I've got in my canoe are the same things that I've used to build this and yeah, and yeah it's cohesive in that way then yeah. okay um I thought that we might do a, a little more I thought I might help you with rigging and things today but what was it that we done today just to... um so what we've done today is put some signs up so um <laughs> one of the joys of being in a public woodland is that it's a public space and we're getting to use that space and there's people wandering about the flip side of that is that there's people wandering about and they tend to wander in places they're not supposed to um so in general i don't mind people walking through the woods wherever they want like it's here to be enjoyed and i kind of advocate access and all that sort of thing um if i'm running an axe session or an archery session or something and somebody wanders where they don't want to be there it just becomes a bit of a risk assessment nightmare and um, so we were just putting some signs at either end of the footpath essentially saying you know we're operating courses here wander around um but specifically it's not i shouldn't say footpath i suppose it's not it's not a, a footpath it's a trail that has been made by mountain bikers and off-road bikers unfortunately uh, clean through a pristine bit of woodland um so part of that is the forestry wanting to minimize the amount of ground that's been churned up because uh, unlike walkers the mountain bikes tend to churn um so minimizing that a little bit and then yeah just in general trying to make this space um as quiet as we can so just polite signs so a lot of um, using the axe and the saw to make posts about as tall as that um and then using a big we've yet to decide what it's called have we heavy right. heavy metal sleeve yeah. to slam them into the ground um and then yeah just just um disguising the the trail as much as we can to try and stop these mountain bikers from coming through thanks again hey, no worries. um where can people go if they want to learn more uh, or either come and actually visit the site and yeah. come to a course best place to go to howlbushcraft.com mm -hmm. or find us on facebook and instagram at howlbushcraft yeah Brilliant. it's all on there all right well yeah uh, thanks everyone for joining us today uh, if you want more videos like this just comment below um, and i want to come across <laughs>